Welcome to all of you and welcome to our special guests, uh, Rachel and, uh, and Karun. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Fletcher for the first time, I think. Um, Rachel, as was just pointed out, is now with Politico, formerly with the Washington Post. Uh, she, like uh, Karun, as you may know, has been a frequent uh, guest on the Sunday morning talk shows. And you've seen her with Karun on um, CNN frequently doing political commentary. Karun needs no introduction to many people in this audience. Uh, as was just noted, she received the uh, Women's Leadership Award here uh, three years ago. Yes certainly one of our most distinguished alumni and speaking from personal experience, one of our most brilliant students. Uh, she uh, is of course uh, uh, a Washington Post reporter who has had various swings at the national security beat over the last few years. Currently she's a Pentagon correspondent. Um, before that uh, she was, uh, posted to the Moscow Bureau. She's had a lot of experience uh, in this realm. Um, before we engage in this um, little informal uh, hour conversation among the three of us, I just want to uh, give a personal note of congratulations to the two of you. I didn't think it would be possible to write a book that was at once the authoritative source for historians on the two Trump impeachment efforts. And I think that'll be true for many decades to come. Um, that is at the same time, a real page turner. <laughs> and uh, somehow you managed to thread the needle. It's encyclopedic and suspenseful at the same time. I don't know how you did that. We're gonna to try to find out <laughs> over the next hour, but uh, it's a tremendous accomplishment and congratulations to you both. Thanks very much, we're glad it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I just said, we're glad it's done. <laughs> I'm gonna start with uh, a question that I suspect you are getting tired of hearing on the no book thing. tour circuit. Um, you, uh, between the two of you, have, have written thousands of words as reporters for Politico and the Post on these two impeachment efforts. Um, why did you write the book? What does this add to the pre-existing reportage? So, um... Rachel and I were both at the Washington Post when the first impeachment uh, started. And we had been covering the players in this for a long time. We both at that point had independently, each of us more than about a decade of experience covering Capitol Hill. Um, and we were, look, this was the first time that Capitol Hill was making its own impeachment totally from scratch. There was no special prosecutors report. Everything was happening very, very quickly considering that they truncated it all to it within about two months. And about a month into this whole impeachment investigation, the first time, which was the Ukraine related one, we kind of realized that we weren't able to keep up. Our editors were asking questions about, you know, why are there only two weeks of hearings happening? What do you mean? That doesn't sound anything like what it was in Watergate. You know, why are these decisions being taken? So we were struggling to be able to answer as many of those questions as we could, as well as just cover the daily news churn of what was happening and, and, and staking out those those. Uh, private meetings and those those depositions and 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 getting the breaking news story that was seemed so incessant that kept us chained to the Capitol for like 15, 16 hours a day. Um, and we also were hearing rumblings from the sources that we had built up over the years who were expressing incomplete thoughts of frustration with how things were going that seemed to suggest that there was something behind the official narrative from both sides, both leaders of both parties, that wasn't the full story. But we didn't have time because the story was moving so quickly. And we and we didn't have the ability to, um, it's not just that we didn't have time, people, because everything was so, the stakes were so high and the story was moving, people weren't willing to open up much further than those murmurings. And so we kind of independently each came to the thought of this, this is a book project and we are uniquely situated, even though neither of us have ever done this before, 
to try to do this and kind of approached each other to take that on. Yeah. The murmurings, just to sort of highlight some of the themes of the book, um, we were hearing from Democrats, they were putting out this sort of publicly unified front behind Speaker Pelosi. Uh, everybody sort of united in this impeachment effort but we would hear from our sources behind the scenes that they were not happy with what they were doing and that they felt like their case was sort of uh, falling flat with the public and they should be doing more to show the nation that Trump was dangerous. Um, and they were getting frustrated because they were getting batted back. And on the Republican side, you know, they also had a unified front behind Trump or, or so it seemed. But then we would hear from people about frustrations they had. Uh, just off the record at that time um, about what was going on and frustrations with Trump and how do we defend this guy, et cetera. And so basically we wanted to report out these two threads. Um, and there's sort of this, I would just say in terms of what this book adds uh, that's not already out there, there's been a lot of reporting about uh, you know, Trump and his norm shattering White House. There have not been any books about Congress and how and why they failed to check him. And specifically, you know, the decisions Speaker Pelosi made, Kevin McCarthy made, uh, Mitch McConnell made, that sort of led us to this moment where we could see Trump in the White House again. Um, it's not an impossibility. Um, and then we'd also say that there are these um, preconceived notions out there. One is that these in, these the two acquittals were sort of inevitable. We find in the book that there were a lot of very close moments where things could have flown swung a different way uh, in terms of Trump getting convicted, potentially barring him from office. Um, and then there's this other notion that, you know, the reason Trump got away with everything was because Republicans just defended him and Democrats did everything they could to try to get him convicted from office. We found that, you know, that was not the case in the latter. Democrats really cut corners. They pulled punches. Uh, all in the name of political expediency. And because of that, you know, a lot of those decisions would come back to bite them. I would just add one quick thing, just to put a last point on it. We also realized as we were thinking about this, like presidential impeachments happen so seldom, right? That each one matters a lot. Um, there's so few directions in the constitution for how you go about impeachment, that the precedent matters a lot. And we realized that something was happening to impeachment also. In the in the time in the process that we were following this, but we couldn't quite put our finger on exactly what the stakes of it were, and that took going back too. So this is a story not just of the pol the political actors at a really really unique and striking and shocking time, which I think everybody agrees that the Trump years were, no matter where you come down in the political spectrum, that it was different, right? But there was also something that happened to the levers of power, to the balance of power constitutionally, that we were going to try to get at, and that's part of what we were doing in this book too. I want to. Uh pursue issues that each of you raised. Uh, first, what the precedent uh, is or was, and second, uh, what could have been done differently to make things swing differently. But before getting into the details of this, I just want to ask you a couple of methodological questions about how you went about writing the book, given that, as you said, Karun, you've you've not done this before. How do you jointly write a book that's nearly 700 pages long? Do you, do you um, alternate writing chapters and then give the chapter to your co-author to revise it? Or it, it's, it, as a reader, I, I've got to tell you, it, it looked seamless to me. I couldn't detect any difference in style from one chapter to the next. How do you achieve that? Oh, well, that would be because... <laughs> Um, look, we, we did most of the interviews for the book together, not absolutely all of them, but we had, did over 250 interviews for this. And most of them, I think we were we were both, if not in the room, because we did much of this during the pandemic, then on, on the conference okay. call lines. And, and, and so we were working with the same set of information in, in that way. Rachel and I didn't know each other that well before we started this project. And we are extremely different styled people. It's not just the blonde brunette thing. We are stylistically different. Rachel is um, indefatigably um, determined. She, there's not a brick wall she won't try to run through. I am the person who will, you know, just rip my way and not sleep for two nights as I just go down rabbit holes of trying to, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, truth squad and see if like things are actually matching up. We write in different ways. We think in different ways, she but can smell and I can't. that's not, <laughs> I'm not true. I don't, I'm a terrible, terrible. <laughs> so, 
So what we would do is we would basically go through our chapter outlines, which obviously changed a million times between conception and, and final execution. We would break things up. We had different source yeah, tools too different. when we went to this, right? So we would break things up based on what we felt like was more under our fingernails and where we understood the nuance of the person and the, the, the background and the history of that piece of it more. Um, we would write those chapters in Google Docs, which isn't very safe, but you know, it was a pandemic. We would swap them. We would rip the shreds out of them with the fine with the track changes, and then we would get on the phone and we would scream at each other for five or six hours about how awful the other person's contributions and suggestions were. In a nice way, where we also just are both the personalities where we can have that sort of a fist fight rumble and wake up the next morning being like, "This is going to be a great day. We're going to do it again, and it's going to be fun." Yeah, yeah. I mean. You will see, and I thank you for saying that it doesn't read like one person wrote this chapter and the other person wrote this chapter, but it really was sort of us going over our work together, Karin starting a chapter, me tearing that apart, and and then getting back on the phone and sort of ironing out to try to find that unified unified voice. And that it's it's not easy. We wrote a lot of the chapters like multiple times to try to do to try to do that. But in terms of source spaces, I mean, Karen obviously she um, had a lot of connections with the intelligence committee, which Adam Schiff was running the first impeachment. So there was a lot of, you know, she was getting inroads with them on that. And then I covered leadership. I covered um, House Republicans during Paul Ryan's reign as Speaker, and then you know obviously the Democratic leadership too. So like we just we were able to sort of pull different threads uh, to try to piece the story together and, and, and find the narrative. My, my last and second question on methodology concerns um, the standard by which stuff got into the book. What was the evidentiary standard and, and methodology? Um, you, I suspect, had some disagreements in these conversations about what uh, warranted getting in. Um, and I, I give you an example of what I'm talking about. You, you discuss, for example, the Republican concerns about witness depositions and where the leaks were coming from and point out that Adam Schiff was a constant source of suspicion for the Republicans. And yet you write Schiff personally was not the source of any escaping information. Um, what's the methodology or standard of proof that leads you to a determination like that? Fair question. Um, <clears throat> it is getting multiple sources and finding out where many of the leaks came from, honestly. We knew some of that in real time and we reported out some of that after in, in the reporting of the book too. And once we knew what the origin was of these things, we could make that conclusion. Um, it's not just because, you know, Adam Schiff is like, I didn't do it. And they're like, aha, Adam Schiff didn't do it. That's not enough. You know, you need to basically, there's a lot of reporting that went into finding out this origin of many of those leaks that is behind that very pithy statement. Right. But that is something that we had, I think, well over half a dozen. Well, for the major leaks, like we would, we held ourselves to the same reporting standard that we did as newspaper reporters, right? You need two or three sources, ideally three or more sources to corroborate any piece of information. We didn't write it in the way of like, according to X number of people in these sorts of places around Capitol Hill, because the book is already 604 pages long and that would be extremely pedantic and make it about, you know, at least a third longer than that. And it would uh, ruin the whole page turner aspect of it. But that was something that we held ourselves to that reporting standard but tried to write it in ways where we could speak with that omniscient narrator who knows things that have been deeply reported and can present them more simply. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, yeah, we ran into, in terms of like methodology, we ran into some challenges with um, certain leadership offices. We have a note in the front of the book about Speaker Pelosi's office initially cooperating with us, yeah. you know, Speaker herself. And then um, once she sort of learned some of the reporting we had, which is not sanctioned, to be given to us by her office because you know they obviously want her to appear in a certain light uh publicly they they cut us off and started going around to scare sources um and try to get them to change their story so you know there's that challenge of things as well where we had not just pelosi's office schumer's office did the same thing um and we had some republican sources as well who very much used our interviews as sort of therapy sessions um and then once we sort of did our fact checking with them, because we fact checked everything, you know, um, even those who 
gave us certain information. We, we fact-checked with them, uh, tried to get us not to write what they had told us, uh, which, you know, we weren't going to, we weren't going to backtrack on that. So, you know, it's, it's tricky, but you sort of just look at the book, the reporting process, as you would any story in terms of like what Karin was saying, multiple sources. If somebody denies something, we allowed them in the back of the book to give us a statement to deny it. And we explained why, in spite of their denial, we went with what we knew to be true, which is because of, you know, four people who were in the room saying this happened versus, you know, somebody trying to save face. Good. Uh, one last question before we get into the details of the first impeachment. Um, you indicated that you were shocked by what you learned in the course of your research and reporting on the book. You are both veteran Washington insiders who can't be shocked very easily. <laughs> Tell us what shocked you. Um, look, everybody, yes, we are very jaded people um, <laughs> as a baseline. And yet there are still moments, and can I get into some of the, the story? Sure. That, look, we have gotten to know a lot of these sources who ended up becoming characters in the book, right? Because they were major players. And we know about how, how, how motivated by politics people like Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy and Nancy Pelosi are. It's not surprising that like the, the stuff about, you know, how there were political considerations that motivated Nancy Pelosi all the way up to and through the impeachment, not the constitution, not her statements about no one is above the law. That's not surprising. But there's moments in the first impeachment and the ones that are immediately coming to mind are in the second impeachment that we didn't know about missed opportunities before we started digging in. We all know about January 6th, right? We all watched it happen. We all knew it was a shocking moment for the country. And we all thought that Democrats, you know, had run at the idea of impeaching him again fairly quickly. Well, in the course of our reporting, we have these really vivid scenes about how some of the, um, some of the more liberal uh, House Democrats, rank and file, who had been the ones pushing Pelosi into impeachment the first time, were, as the riot is happening on the House floor, sitting in their office, writing articles of impeachment that they then present to the Democratic leaders that night and say, let's do this now, before Republicans have a chance to think, before they have a chance to be pulled back off this. And Pelosi says, no, I'm not going to do it. And she, for five more days, she keeps saying no and tries to get Adam Schiff to shut it down and, and, and various things that she's that's so afraid of impeachment that even in a moment like that, there was an opportunity to act that could have created more open doors. There's also another part of this, we can go into more of this detail, but continuing with the second trial where, you know, uh, again, I don't know how closely you all watched it, but on the last day of the second impeachment trial, which Jamie Raskin led, he is probably the smartest constitutional lawyer in Congress, right? And somebody who is, you know, if, if you're painting this all as like a, a, a Shakespearean tragedy or whatever, right? He is the one who is very much motivated by trying to do what's right, right? He's not, he's not a great politician, but he's a really great like thinker when it comes to what are the, what is the future going to judge us by? Like, what is the actual law here that we should be doing? And so he's got this almost idealism, right? That he's going to try to push his way through. And so on the last day, he gets this vote from the Senate, which we were all going into work that Saturday thinking the trial was going to end. And Jamie Raskin decides to take one last go at this. I want to have witnesses, right? I want to see if I can flex the muscle of a congressional subpoena to bring Mike Pence's aides in, to bring the Secret Service in, to bring Republicans in. And he has this last burst of maybe I can do this because Jamie Herrera Butler, who is a congresswoman from Washington state, um, has gone public the day before by telling the world about a conversation that happened between Donald Trump and Kevin McCarthy on January 6th, the one in which Trump said, oh, Kevin, I guess the mob likes me better than you do, right? And that is a moment, a burst of, we can't let this go without trying, right? There's incredible pressure not to let the trial drag on because their Democrats are afraid it'll put a cloud over Biden's nascent presidency. But, you know, so Saturday, he gets this vote from the Senate. Jamie Herrera Butler wakes up on the West Coast because her aide calls her to wake her up and says, um, Jamie Raskin is saying on the Senate floor right now that he wants to call you as a witness. And like, are you aware of what's going on? She's like, excuse me, what? What's <laughs> so she gets on the phone and she calls um, the House counsel. His name is Doug Letter. He is the lawyer that Pelosi has handpicked for the House. And she says, OK, if I want to come forward and testify, I just need some advice about how I'm going to do this. And he's like, I'm sorry, I can't advise you. And he never passes on the message. Right. And so she's scrambling to get legal advice as the whole Democratic Party apparatus is coming down to squish out this 
effort to do things in a more, you know, more to, to see if Congress can actually use all the powers that it has technically as its disposal versus kind of just make it all go away. And these are themes that we can talk about in more detail. And, and it's like a series of missed opportunities that, but for another hour, how different could history have been? Those are the things that shocked us really. It wasn't just that people have different things that they're thinking behind the surface than what they say in public, but is this idea of you know how the whole major institutional precedent setting experience of the Trump impeachment rose and fall, fell in so many you know, seemingly pedestrian circumstances on just the doubts and flaws of human beings who just should have maybe waited or acted an hour faster, what have you. It's that was the mind boggling stuff for us. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I feel like there's been a lot of reporting about Republican hypocrisy in the Trump era, especially on Capitol Hill, you know, Kevin McCarthy, my Kevin, as Trump calls him, like, you know, standing behind Trump, but then doing something behind the scenes. What we had never seen reporting on is the hypocrisy of the Democrats. Um, and the book is just full of examples where um, they just short circuited their whole impeachment effort. Um, and we saw, you know, Trump is still around today. Like, could they have done something different to put him away for good in politics? In terms of the second impeachment, um, you know, the shockers for me were. You know, Biden, I think he's going to give another democracy speech today. I think I saw a breaking news report of, on that um, this morning and talking about, you know, the dangers of, you know, the big lie and Republicans and, um, you know, what is this doing to our republic? But in a moment where it mattered, the Biden White House shut down the Democrats, uh, Jamie Raskin, the impeachment leader who was trying to get, we report in the book, um, he was trying to get like the Secret Service to testify and people who were bringing Trump Diet Cokes at the White House on January 6th to just tell the story of what Trump was doing that day in a moment where Trump was the most weakest politically, um, you know, right after January 6th and the moment where they could have tried to convict him and bar him from office. You know, the Biden White House was putting pressure on the impeachment managers to wrap everything up so that they could start their agenda and start confirming their own cabinet officials. Uh, same thing with Chuck Schumer. I mean, publicly endorsed the second impeachment after January 6th, the morning after January 6th. But then him and his counsel were putting pressure on the Democrat impeachment managers to not call in Republican witnesses. And we have reporting in the book about how a lot of Republican senators we're on the fence and they, at the, you have to go back to what we know at the time. We didn't know what Trump was doing. We know a lot now, but we didn't know then. And like, you know, what would have happened if Raskin wasn't feeling that pressure and was bringing all these, these started bringing all these witnesses in, could he have gotten to a conviction? It's just, I, it's moments like this where you see things happen so closely and it, it's almost, we talk about how it's almost Shakespearean, like how sort of tragic some of this stuff is. But anyway, yeah, it's still surprising, even for us who are cynical and very jaded on Capitol Hill. One of the things that surprised me, uh, I must say, was the extent to which Nancy Pelosi, who seemed publicly to be, you know, such a firebrand when it came to Donald Trump, really dragged her feet uh, initially for the longest time and opposed uh, Jerry Nadler's effort to get the impeachment train moving. And her rationale was it's got to be um, bipartisan. And she had lived through the Clinton impeachment and saw how the blowback and backlash can occur if it's not bipartisan. And yet she changed her mind. Um, what would have been the downside of making this bipartisan from the outset? And it wasn't. I mean, even the decision to initiate the impeachment probe was made only by the Democrats. And the Republicans were cut out of a lot of things along the way. Is that one of the things that could have been done differently? Would the result have been different? Why not make it? What, what's the downside of making it bipartisan? Uh, there are two two things on that. The first is Pelosi. Um, yeah, that's one of the, the big sort of revelations of part one is that even though Pelosi was out there always saying no one is above the law, you know, trying to sort of act like she was tough on Trump, we report that she sort of dragged her feet uh, 
Nadler would talk about how she was twisting the Democrats into knots by, you know, slowing oversight and and uh, basically limiting investigative threads. We report in the book that she it's not that she changed her mind so much as she got forced into impeachment um, after the Ukraine news broke that Trump was trying to use taxpayer dollars to get Ukraine to do these investigations of Joe Biden, who was obviously most likely in polls to beat him uh, in 2020. Uh, we report that uh, there was this sort of behind the scenes movement. Well, the movement had sort of been building in the in the progressive community, but there was a group of frontliners who she was trying to protect people from Trump districts, who she, the moderate whole Democrats. moderate Democrats, I should say, yeah. the whole reason she didn't want to do impeachment was because she was worried about them losing their seats. And she was worried that if they were to do impeachment, she would lose her house majority. So she didn't want to do this for a long time. She tried to, she tried to snuff it out for nine months when the Ukraine saga, saga breaks she basically gets forced into it and she knows how to count. Uh, that's why she's a great speaker and gets a lot of stuff passed legislatively. And she basically lost her, the rest of her members. She lost her caucus. And so she had, she was sort of forced into doing it, even though she did not want to. And as for bipartisanship, um, you know, we report in the book that, you know, in the Nixon impeachment and the Clinton impeachment, there were just certain precedents that were set in terms of, meeting with the other side of the aisle to iron out the rules of the road, giving the minority due process or, or giving the minority rights, giving the president due process. The Democrats didn't want to take the time to do that. They also worried that Trump would sort of hijack any sort of rights he was given to uh, go after Joe Biden. And so they decided they were going to do this on their own. And we actually have a, a story in the book about one moderate Republican, uh, Jamie Herrera Butler, who was really concerned about what Trump did in Ukraine and thought there should be an impeachment investigation. And she says, why shouldn't I vote for this? Why shouldn't I support this? And you, we show in real time how her leadership team, Kevin McCarthy, is able to take this process that the Democrats use, this very one-sided process, and whip her into a frenzy so that she ends up staying with the team. And there was a bunch of moderate Republicans the same way who were like, why are the Democrats not asking us, you know, reaching out to us and, and doing like they did in Clinton and in Nixon, this sort of bipartisan, at least agreement on the road. If you can't agree on the substance, that's one thing, right? But agreement on the road of the, the rules to be fair anyway hold. i mean it, it this is this is the thing that look the impeachment power is the one oversight power that the constitution actually explicitly gives to congress that they, there's been others that have been established through various statutory moves and committees that have been set up and all the rest of it but it's um it's also in it it says you know you're supposed to impeach congress the, the Congress can impeach based on supposed to be treason, bribery, high crimes, misdemeanors, right? But it doesn't tell you the how of doing it. Um, it doesn't say you should follow X, Y, Z steps along the way. It really is up to Congress to decide for itself. But the, but the gold standard was the water, Watergate years, right? Where they did go through the steps that Rachel outlined. You have minority buy-in. Um, Peter Rodino, who was running the Watergate investigation, actually fired his staff director because his staff director was considered to be too partisan a Democrat and hired a Republican to run things. So he'd have the, the look of, you know, at least that saying, here's my gesture at trying to be bipartisan. There were Republicans who said, OK, you know, the frame, we agree on the framework of all of this. We, we still think Nixon's a great guy. Um, but, you know, we agree on the framework at the outset. They went through the process of taking their subpoenas, enforcing them, trying to go to the courts, getting court decisions that said, yes, these people have to turn over documents. That's why the Nixon tapes came out. Yes, witnesses have to be actually show up to testify. You end up having people like John Dean, you know, that act like that there's uh, firsthand witness after firsthand witness after firsthand witness who shows up. And the legacy of all of that is that, OK, this was a fair process. Right. And, and even Republicans who defended Nixon at the beginning, slowly, slowly, slowly over time, became so appalled by what they learned through that fair process. Right. That they decided, OK, we can't support you anymore. And Nixon leaves office before before the impeachment can happen. Clinton, the substance of it, clearly much more political and, you know, less weighty in many ways, but they actually adopted the rules of the road verbatim from the Nixon years, changing the names, changing the dates, but it was exactly the same thing. There was an outreach process that was done. They went into private chambers. They talked about this. They yelled at each other. They couldn't agree on everything in the end, but they tried like that. Those steps were taken and they actually did run down those subpoenas again. So you actually, you know, had these efforts being made in the Trump years. There were these, they were watching the political calendar. They were afraid because nobody had ever stonewalled Congress quite to the extent that Trump had. 
And so they decided to pull punches. They did not flex the full power that they had. They, they, they did, were afraid the Republicans would say no, so they never tried to bring them under the umbrella in the first place. Um, they were afraid that the courts would take too long for, with their subpoenas or that Trump would find new ways of like filing appeals. They never tried to actually go after, after those and enforce them, right? And so in the end, it's kind of like if you don't use it, you lose it sort of philosophy. And it's just a weaker, it's a weaker thing right now. I mean, you used to at least structurally have impeachment be a constitutional failsafe that seemed fair, that seemed strong, right? Now it's kind of more usurpable as a, a, a tool to express political animus that is ripe for abuse in the very near future going forward. I want to get to that. That's a big and important point. It's really the central lesson of your of your book, I think, in, in some ways. But I want to uh, follow up on your point about the due process issue yeah. and the extent to which there was disagreement within the Democratic caucus in the House on the extent to which uh, Trump should be accorded the same due process rights that Clinton and uh, Nixon had had both had. There was a very interesting split between Jerry Nadler and Adam Schiff on that point. Could you could you talk about that? They even Nadler's people enlisted Larry Tribe as the ultimate weapon oh, on their side. Tell that. us tell us about that. Um, yeah. Um, so. Uh, the, the rules of the road that were being designed, and, and look, Adam, Adam the, the, there were impeachment-minded lawyers on both Adam Schiff's committee and Jerry Nadler's committee because the Judiciary Committee was assuming that they would get the investigative ball and run with it across the finish line, right? Because that's how it's done, it's historically done. Um, but you know, Schiff and Pelosi have more influence, have more control, and so they're passing these drafts of what the rules for how we are going to go about this impeachment investigation happen. And in it, they have basically said Trump's due process rights, his rights to actually represent himself if he wants to take advantage of it before we impeach, are going to be conditional on him actually turning over all of the documents that we have asked for, right? which they're saying, well, he's stonewalling us. So why should we give him his day to grandstand and usurp the process if he's not going to play ball with us? And Nadler, who's the better constitutional lawyer, Schiff was a great prosecutor, but Nadler's the, the better constitutional law, law mind, is saying that's not how it works. If he's saying there's an actual debate here about whether you know you are, we are justified in having demanded these documents, that's something we can fight about. That's something we can even impeach him over for obstruction of Congress. But we can't say your rights to due process, your rights to actually have your day in the court of Congress, so to speak, are conditional on you first meeting this thing. That's unconstitutional. And it gets this, like, there's this very dramatic meeting where, you know, Nadler gets the latest draft of the rules and he rallies his whole impeachment team, which is, um, and they call Larry Tribe on speakerphone because one of his lawyers that he'd hired on staff, Joshua Matz, had actually written an impeachment book with Larry Tribe like right before. And so, and they're like, Larry, what do you think? And he's just like, yeah, of course I agree. This is unconstitutional. And they march in Alex Vindman, Alexander Vindman, the, the very, the, the, um, you know, the, the Soviet born um, NSC employee is actually giving his deposition at the time and shift guests get pulled out of the deposition because Nadler and his team walk in and they're like, we need to talk about this. And he's saying, you know, Adam, this is unconstitutional. We cannot do this. And Schiff is just like, well, Pelosi agrees with me. And it's like, you're, it's a moment where you can see that the politically minded wing of the party is having an actual fight with the more like precedently minded wing of the party. And it's that clash. And that's, that clash keeps happening. That's one very dramatic microcosm of this problem that exists throughout both of the impeachments. Are we protecting a, a tool here or are we doing something that is politically expedient because of the time that we're in? And they end up writing in a little fail safe that basically says Nadler can waive this if he wants to in the Judiciary Committee. And so that's the way they kind of get around it. But it, it still ends up, you know, fundamentally being a, a much more skewed sort of a, a, a structure for how this is supposed to go forward and less fair, and the Republicans can point to it, than it was in Nixon or Clinton. Now I want to follow up on the, the Republicans pointing to it. And yeah, you, can, you, can, you can both address this issue because I think this is a big question. As you know, five impeachment resolutions have already been introduced in the House of Representatives to impeach more than, more than five, to impeach President Biden. And the likelihood, I think, you can tell us whether this is true, is that if the Republicans get control of the House of Representatives, they're gonna move forward that issue. Yeah. So my question to you is, have the Democrats 
made it easier for them to do that by establishing a precedent of watered down due process in the Trump cases. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And we are predicting a, a Biden impeachment, you know, as soon as next year, if not a bunch of cabinet officials, they're talking about impeaching uh, Mayorkas, I mean, over the border issue. Um, we basically talk in our epilogue how, about how we think impeachment is going to become the norm from now on. We're going to see it happening all the time with, you know, almost every president, perhaps. Um, yeah, the shortcuts that the Democrats used to try to get their first impeachment over with quickly, they've definitely set this precedent. I mean, now Republicans under Jim Jordan are probably not going to be reaching out to Democrats for rules of the road, right? They're just going to sort of jam this through. There's now precedent for not giving Biden any due process, any sort of say. Um, there is now precedent for allowing sort of an impeachment without even trying to call in witnesses uh, or firsthand witnesses to whatever the impeachable offense is. So, you know, we could see them do a, a snap impeachment like they did after January 6th on a dime very quickly without even an investigation. And it's interesting, too, because, you know, in terms of impeachment precedent, there was only one impeachment that was ever done very quickly. And that was the first one, uh, Andrew Johnson's, which a lot of impeachment historians sort of looked at that as a terrible uh, way to go about impeachment. They sort of actually called it congressional malpractice and uh, congressional abuse of office because what they did in that day was they impeached Johnson over firing one of his cabinet secretaries that a lot of the members of Congress actually liked. And so they were angry with that. Um, and they impeached him in one weekend and then wrote the articles after there was no investigation. It was like, you know, very quickly done and shoddily done. But now there is more, a more legitimate precedent to impeach on a snap vote uh, right after January 6th, without a full investigation, et cetera. Um, and I, do, I mean, there's no doubt we have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Jim Jordan and Congress who, you know, play McCarthy like a fiddle. Let's be honest. I mean, McCarthy has always wanted to be speaker and he knows that in order to be to have this sort of power and this dream job he has always wanted, he's going to have to mollify this wing, this Trump wing uh, to stay in power. And so we have seen over and over again about how he will cave to them, even though, you know, his own ethics and, and moral compass are telling him to do something else, which we detail in the book a bunch about that. So yeah, this is going to happen. And Democrats have made it much easier for this to happen. I would add one thing, which is that there's two potential bad ways this goes, right? One is that, like Rachel was saying, the Republicans can just kind of impeach because they feel like it without having to go through the hassle of maybe having a witness come forward who's like, this, these are bogus charges. This is ridiculous. This is a policy dispute, not what impeachment is for. But it also is going to, through that those processes, which are clearly very close on the horizon, you're also going to find a White House that is going to double down on the idea of stonewalling, right? They're going to be like, go pound sand. We are not going to help you. There is some actual legitimate investigative strings that the House could pull with the Biden administration. They have not really looked into Afghanistan yet because it's been a Democratic Congress. There's real questions there about, you know, what Biden decided to do overruling the advice of his senior advisors and people died, right? That's something that in a normal time you would see a congressional investigation, but it's going to get wrapped up in all the other political stuff. And you're going to see that Biden, like Trump before, ends up basically being like closed for business. And the interesting thing for this is, is that, you know, the whole time we were going through the impeachment processes. Democrats were pointing to their fear of flexing their subpoena power by pointing to the case that was pending on Don McGahn. This is, he's the former White House counsel, Trump's, that was a major character in the Mueller report, right? And the Judiciary Committee in early May, right? Early May of 2019, so pre the Democrats fully embracing impeachment, wanted to call him for testimony. They file a subpoena, they do the contempt vote, they actually, the House takes him to court. And it was dragging on for years and years and years, this case, right? And so um, basically, you know, uh, people that, the, Nadler, Schiff, everybody that was, you know, thinking, you know, oh, should we go after somebody like John Bolton to put a smoking gun in Trump's hands? Should we try to go after, in the second impeachment, you know, Mike Pence's aides, somebody that was there with Trump that could actually close this case in a way that would convince some of the moderate Republicans who were approaching Pelosi on the floor even and saying, I will vote to impeach, just give me a firsthand witness like Bolton, who says the same thing as all these other people, and I'll do it. You'll, you'll have a bipartisan vote for Trump, right? But they didn't go there. 
Um, in the end, <laughs> after all this, oh, but the McGann case, oh, but the McGann case, which frankly was not a case that had the urgency of an impeachment behind it, the Democrats settled with the Biden administration because Biden did not want to have a case that went up to a Supreme Court decision saying, you cannot screw with a congressional subpoena. A congressional subpoena is something that must actually be obeyed. There, they never got that final ruling and they kind of capitulated because Biden was afraid of the GOP coming down the line and going after his administration. So you're gonna both have a combo of incentives for the house not to go through this process, but of the Biden administration also not wanting to respect congressional authority. And yes, there's reasons that we might think that that's legitimate because of the politics of the situation, right? But it's like the, both of those go in a bad direction because the, the, the less the executive branch actually respects the fact that there is any sort of an investigative check from the legislative branch, the more you can have future Trumps that just say, don't, don't ever come looking for anything because I'm not gonna give it to you. And the more you have congressional, um, congressional exercises that aren't willing to flex that muscle because it's not politically convenient, the less it becomes actually a threat to anybody and the balance of power start to kind of fall apart. Geez, that's really an extraordinary uh, revelation to me that the Biden administration opposed strengthening the congressional check that would have occurred as a result of allowing the Supreme Court to weigh in on Congress's side. Is that sarcastic? I'm sorry? <laughs> it's, it's sarcastic that that's a no, revelation. I mean, that's why we are doing this. You know? <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, presidents, look, how many times in the history of this modern history of the country, you don't quiz me on the, you know, the early days of constitution writing, but like, it's only after Watergate, right, that the Congress actually managed to pass a series of post-Nixon reforms that closed these loopholes where Congress had given over too much of its oversight authority, wanted to basically strengthen the guardrails again, right? This has been a problem in foreign policy. Congress keeps handing over its, you know, its, its power to the executive. It's very, very rare that you see Congress approve treaties. The, the, this usually happens with some sort of executive action. That's been a constant complaint. And you always hear Congress being like, we're going to take it back. But they very, very rarely ever do because it's really politically hard to do it because when the party in power, you know, wants the, the, if, if, if the, the Democrats that are in power right now and all three lovers in DC, both chambers of Congress and the White House, right? They're talking about, oh, you know, we need to fix the problems that were exposed by Trump, but you can't fix the structural problems that were exposed by Trump without hamstringing Biden. And that's very inconvenient. And so you end up in this situation where, you know, we didn't talk about how the January 6th committee has been doing its thing, right? And they're retreading a lot of the same turf subject-wise that impeachment two did and doing it a different way and going after the witnesses and trying to prove that like, look, Congress is strong. Our subpoena power is real. The Justice Department will run down these people. We can throw Steve Bannon in jail. Like, look at this stuff that we can do. Yeah, when you have a friendly president, when you have a friendly Justice Department, not when it's the war. And like, can you get the potential abuser of office out of office? We just, Congress defers to the president or is afraid to flex its muscle when it doesn't like the president. And there's no recent past that suggests this is going to change. It's kind of just going. Some people believe they can throw Steve Bannon in jail in the basement of the Capitol without the Justice Department helping. Inherent contempt. That's right. Yay. Um, I want to turn to uh, the question that you just touched upon and again and, and raised earlier, and that is the the precedential effect of all this and what it means for the future. Um, you write in the book that Trump's impeachment laid bare the fundamental weakness of Congress's oversight power uh, and through the future balance of government checks and balances into doubt by weakening impeachment as a tool for future Congresses and made it merely, a, as you just said, a Karun, a political messaging tool, a souped up political messaging tool. Um, how would you how would you respond to a um, Trump voter who pushed back on that? And I should add, you 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 include, the, I, I, and I, I was struck by this, uh, Adam Schiff. At one point, you say, thought to himself that American democracy would be okay, but you say he was wrong. 
Um, what would you what would you say what would you say to a, a Trump voter who says this isn't an example of the failure of congressional oversight or let alone the failure of democracy? This is an example of a situation in which democracy worked. The problem was the Democrats never got the American people behind them. As you point out in the book, after the first impeachment and Trump's acquittal, if Trump had run for re-election, he would have been re-elected easily. So this is an example of the people getting what they wanted. They didn't want Trump pushed out of office. The system worked. Um, I'm trying to think here. So your question then is, what would you say to a Trump voter who says this worked because the American people, the impeachment failed, basically? Yeah, this this wasn't a situation that demonstrates the weakness of congressional oversight at all. It, it's the, what it demonstrates is that Congress they did went the off goods, the rails in trying to impeach a president that the American people wanted to keep in office. That yeah. was the will of the people. Well, I mean, I would say a couple of things. One is that, you know, Trump, when it came to congressional oversight, he did something that no other president has ever done. You know, there's always been this sort of clash between the legislative branch and the executive branch about investigative information with Congress subpoenaing the executive branch and them saying, OK, we'll give you this information, but we're going to fight you in court on this other stuff. But what Trump did was very much he said he was going to ignore. He literally said it all the subpoenas and he shut down every single congressional investigation that they tried to have. Um, when Democrats took the House. And so that in and of itself, I mean, you can't argue that, you know, the system is working. If Congress cannot do its fundamental job of oversight, like they cannot investigate anything. How do you investigate anything if you can't get information? That is, number one, extremely problematic. Um, and in terms of impeachment, I mean, a Trump voter might say, OK, this impeachment failed because it was no good, right? Like, Trump got acquitted because he should get acquitted, right? Um, the issue there is that, like, a lot the the entire thing that they impeached him on would later be John Bolton would write, later write a book saying, "I personally heard from Trump's lips that I he was he was overseeing this attempted quid pro quo." So there actually was were smoking guns that Democrats could have gotten, but they chose not to, right? Um, so like the impeachment, it failed but not because Trump wasn't guilty per se. It was because they couldn't get the facts to sort of prove it and show the public. You think that Trump was guilty? Of course. I mean, look, John Bolton, John Bolton says that he specifically heard Trump talk about this. We would later see there's other things that they chose not to investigate, right? Um, campaign finance issues. Here's another good one. Uh, the hush payments to those two women and alleging affairs during the 2016 campaign. One issue that Democrats thought about investigating was that, but Pelosi shut it down. We would later learn this year, in fact, that that whole investigation, Trump was never charged because there was pressure from um, uh, Bill Barr uh, on that whole investigation not to go after Trump. And so that prosecutor would later write about this. Democrats would choose not to investigate it because they didn't want to take the time. Another thing, you know, that they could have investigated that they did not, Trump using the White House to pad his pocketbooks. I mean, he's the, his pocketbook. He, the only president who would not divest from his own company, uh, stayed at Mar-a-Lago. A ton of taxpayer dollars went into to his pocket for that. He was charging the secret, secret service, we would later learn, over $1,000 a night for their stay at Maragalago. That's that's your money. That's your taxpayer money. And then also, you know, government officials staying at his hotels to try to curry favor with Trump uh, to get something done from him. There's another area that they did not investigate, but there was potential proof that this was going on. Um, but Democrats didn't want to take the time to do it. I want to take a shot at your first question again. Um, I would it, not to adopt like the reading rainbow line of you don't have to take my word for it, but there are scenes in the book in which, um, okay, so the Trump voter who says that democracy worked, then we have scenes in the book where we have Kevin McCarthy and Jim Jordan who are publicly telling the country like Trump is completely right to shut down this 
completely bogus investigation because it's an outrage and it's wrong. Literally leaving the microphones where outside of the skiff where we were standing in the house basement, getting in cars, going to the White House and being like, you are screwing us here, Mr. President. You need to actually respond to congressional oversight subpoenas for an impeachment. It's all we have. Long term, this is going to be a real problem. You need to cough this stuff up. You cannot disrespect us like this. This was a weeks long. They were having this fight as they were telling the country that it was and telling the Trump voters, right, that Trump is right. There's nothing to see here. Privately, they were telling the president, this is really, really bad. You cannot do this. This is bad for the long-term health of everything. You're not going to be in office forever, which I'm sure, you know, there's varying opinions of how, how that message may have gotten to Trump well. And in terms of, you know, whether he did it or not, Ted Cruz, we have a scene where, the, you know, the Senate Republicans have a lot of smart lawyers, right? And um, including Ted Cruz, whose case I studied in your class, actually, the Medellin one, right? That's right. That's right. Anyway, um, <laughs> total tangent. But anyway, they are so frustrated with, frustrated with how Trump's defenders are defending him in the first Senate trial that Ted Cruz goes back to their green room, basically the side chamber off of the Senate floor and says, not a single person in here, this 100 person chamber, zero, believe you when you say there was no quid pro quo. Obviously, there was a quid pro quo. Stop making that argument. We're not as dumb as the people in the House. Sorry. <laughs> but basically, that's what he's saying. And he's just like, just start arguing that it was okay. Start arguing that what the president did was fine. That is the only thing. And it takes days until Alan Dershowitz finally makes that argument. And then he over makes the argument. It sounds almost like he's trying to make Trump into a king. Anyway, point is also the last thing is that the ends don't aren't what justify the means here, right? It's not like if you don't convict, then, then or, or, look, we've talked a lot about the structure and the procedures setting up the impeachment. If your only goal here is to, to convict and a conviction is your only measure or not of whether impeachment was botched, which is the, yeah, well, whether it was botched, which is the, the <laughs> word that we use in our subtitle, then, you know, then all impeachments are ridiculous because the president has never gotten removed from office. So it shouldn't have happened. And this is, you know, the American democratic order says impeachment is a dumb move because like president should never be, be impeached or convicted or removed from office, right? But the question is, like, the, there's the other question that's the more boring institutional one, but the one that we almost argue is more important, you know, than the than the end of conviction or not. What did you do to impeachment in the process, right? I think that that even to the Trump voter, you can make the argument of, well, what about all of these these tools that were broken or allowed to be weakened? Don't you hate? President Biden, don't you want to go after Hunter the next time? Isn't it maybe going to be a little bit harder for you to remove him from office given this recent precedent in history? And that's, I think, probably how you'd answer or how I would try to answer that. What would you say to uh, an observer, a political scientist who looks back now on these two impeachments and says both sides were really mistaken to be cracking their knuckles, wondering about the long-term political fallout of proceeding with only partisan support, um, the, all the disagreements within the Democratic Party. This was a historical nothing burger. You look at these two, three dozen marginal Democratic districts today where the, they're careers are on the line. And the truth is, the people in those districts are concerned about inflation, the war, fuel shortages, food costs, et cetera, et cetera. How many people are really going to vote or for or against those congressional candidates based on their position on the Trump impeachments? Not all that many, and that is Nancy Pelosi's mindset that you just articulated, that the impeachment is a scary thing that can be bad if you're talking about it right now, which is why you want it to go away, and that where people think about is really things that hit them closer to where they live. Um, I think also, though, another element of it is that in terms of being, look, I think it's not a precedential in terms of the structure of impeachment, you know, and the durability of that as a tool of oversight and um, a check on the executive. It's not a nothing burger, but you said political nothing burger. And in a way, I think that you're kind of right about that. You know, um, in the end, uh, it, the way that the, all of the leaders thought that they could control what impeachment would do and they could presage what the future would hold, all of them were wrong. You know, they were. 
Uh, Pelosi was right to worry about impeachment, but she was wrong that doing it the way she did it was going to give Democrats the upper hand. Trump emerged from the first impeachment politically much, much stronger, right? McConnell was wrong. We didn't even get into the Mitch McConnell stuff and all of the the, the reasons that the, him voting to convict based on reasons that he was privately telling people oh were excuse me, voting to quit when he wanted to convict and doing it based on reasons that he was privately telling people were BS, you know, basically, and, and all of that. But McConnell um, thinking that if he could just do just get Trump acquitted, he would just leave and go away. And then they could start to steer the GOP in a different direction. That is addled thinking, right? Um, same deal with McCarthy, that if he could just, you know, maintain the Trump wing of the party, he would become a stronger and stronger leader. Well, he may end up being the speaker in a couple more days, but he's not going to be a particularly strong speaker. He's not going to have an iron grip on his party, his majority, the way that Pelosi did, frankly, even. So it's the whole, all the thinking of I can control my long-term political future here by what I do now was kind of living in your own reality that was very quickly punctured by what happened and proved that all of the leaders is, you know, uh, guesses about what would happen based on their choices in the media were really, really wrong. Like just basically black and white wrong. Well, uh, I'm unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, I just want to uh, conclude by giving you uh, an opportunity to uh, tell us uh, you know the, the long-term implications for democracy. What what is the one thing that you think a reader should take away from the book concerning uh, our democratic future that was not reported by the New York Times or Washington Post that they can find discussed uh, in, and and uh, ventilated in your discussion in the book. I mean, clearly checks and balances is in peril. Um, sorry to be all dark. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to know how we got to this moment and what you're going to get in this book that you won't get, you know, in, an, in we, we didn't see in the Washington Post or the Times or frankly, even Politico at the time is, is um, that Democrats are also at fault here too. Um, I just think that that is a very unique angle of our book. and. Um, Nobody has exposed it. And uh, so that's why I sort of hope we can shed some light on it. Um, I would add, in addition to the enervation of checks and balances, um, that I guess a, a moral point that I would just put on everything is that, um, and something we have found to be true in the reception of the book is that it is difficult for people to question their heroes, right? Especially at this very, 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 intense political moment where the stakes feel so high and they are and there's no argument with that um people really want to believe that uh if the intent of the side that they support was just or was right in their eyes and the execution was perfect which is literally never ever happened ever in the history of time but people really 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 want to believe that right and our book is uncomfortable to read whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, right? Our book is uncomfortable for people to read also because people are like, I lived through impeachment. It feels like ancient history now. Why does it matter? It matters because it's not, I mean, it matters because the of the, you know, general checks and balances constitutional implications. It also matters even if you're just a bare bones political thinker, because this very recent history is going to be the pointed to precedent for the very near future. And that's going to affect not just whether Congress can check a a president that's abusing office in the short or long term, but you know what happens to how how people get sullied. I mean, like, look, part of the reason the Republicans are going to try to impeach Biden most likely is because why not give him the impeachment black eye that Trump already has if they're maybe going to be in a matchup in 2024? And when the system becomes just a political uh, political um, spitball, basically to throw across the aisle it leads you just into a question of, are we gonna come out of this time that we're in? Or are we just kind of gonna keep spiraling into more and more populism, partisanship, sometimes crazy? Um, it's gonna take somebody, and I don't know who that somebody's gonna be, to try to steer the ship in a different direction. And, and even with the gestures that have been made for January 6th, that hasn't happened yet in a way that could actually speak to this sort of situation in the future. And we just want people to think about that and, and, and examine the recent history because of the whole, if you don't look at your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Many things were repeated twice during the two Trump impeachments and, and trials. But just um, we hope that people 
take that uncomfortable venture with us to just analyze their own thinking, analyze their own heroes. It doesn't mean that the political stakes are different than what you think they are, but um, they, they're there in a way where there's fault to be shared in more places than people want to believe. Well, Karun and Rachel, thank you so much. This was terrific. And thank you for writing the book and thank you for being with us. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you.